and we're going to go ahead and it shows me that we are live so this is working well uh, and it looks like everything is working the correct way finally after the technical difficulties that I was having because of me so I'm going to go ahead and get this shared onto a group share that there and we're also going to share this into here uh, now that everything is working we should be able to see this coming up and working uh, we'll get a couple viewers in and we'll start going over the things we talked about earlier and maybe this time it will go a bit smoother than it did uh, also my coffee has cooled down some so I can drink a little bit more than uh, half a teaspoon in an hour all right if you're uh, just coming in we got five viewers now uh, go ahead and make a comment say hi and uh, let me know you're paying attention all right hey Magoo's here how are you doing buddy uh, all right Jamie's here and uh, we're going to get started on this. So tonight we're going to be talking about uh, tool library setup and uh, not just tool library setup, but tool path selection uh, and the efficiency of getting your tool paths set up within the library and then selecting those tools for efficient machining processes. So we'll go ahead and start with opening a fresh copy of our Vectric software. Sean says, Roll Tide. Uh, he recently saw the Alabama uh, plaques that I made in the past. Uh, some of them were real pretty. That that one that was nice, red, Paduke. And uh, with the, the white painted and gray, gray paint in there. Um, we found out that right after the lady bought that for Christmas for her son, he dropped it on Christmas Day and broke it into several pieces. So that was that was pretty cool. Uh, so within our Vectric software, we got we got wow already eleven people in here. That's pretty quick for us. Uh, we'll go ahead and create a new file. These file settings have absolutely no bearing as to what we are doing. Uh, in making this a successful lesson so we'll uh, go ahead and, and just click OK on that what we're really going to be viewing tonight is the tool library so inside this tool library uh, I'm gonna go ahead and remove these things that we covered earlier and we're gonna reload those and I'm gonna go in my files and delete those because they also don't matter so right now in my tool library, if you look in here in this copy of Vectric, you can see that I've got the standard Imperial tools and metric tools. Uh, these are the default types of bits that are loaded into the Vectric software. And you can see inside them, I have loaded in my particular bits that I have. Uh, so we've got our taper ball nose and I put them in with the Amana tool number and inside the notes I put in the uh, cutter parameters for each of these things all right I'm gonna pause this for a second and mute my microphone uh, just give me one second I'll be right back
All right. I uh, apologize to all you guys uh, for the, the moment away. I need to talk on the phone for a second. Uh, so like I was saying, I went through uh, my Amana bit set that I got and put in all of the cutter dimensions on this. So all, out of the notes, uh, max safe speed, tip radius, tip diameter. And then you put all of it in as it says. Now, how fast do you, what is your feed rate what it, for moving your cutter through the material? Now, feed rate is dependent upon tool diameter, number of flutes, and uh, spindle speed. So if we were to go into the Google and look at a feed, feed rate calculator, uh, we would see that spindle speed, diameter, number of flutes, uh, all play into how fast you go. And the last part is chip load. Chip load is important. Uh, Paul says, I see you. Nice looking room for the both of you. Uh, Paul, this is actually her room and I am stealing all of her equipment to make these videos. Uh, so her being patient with me right now is super important. And I thank her for letting me cannibalize all of her equipment or commandeer it. Uh, so as I was saying, making sure that you have your chip load correct. Chip load on this, right, is you look at this is three thousandths or 31 ten thousandths of an inch so that's saying that's how much material pull you're pulling off of each tooth or uh, flute of your cutter as it's coming around for most of our what we're dealing with and i'm going to just say right now what we deal with in especially in this group cnc for beginners and most hobbyist level machines whether it's uh most of your next wave automation machines anything that uses a commercial dewalt bosch porter cable router or anything that uses your uh anywhere between your 800 and 2500 kilowatt uh liquid cooled spindles the hobbyist grade machines those are all in the same range of machine uh with the dewalt router i'm most familiar with but you're going to be looking at a when it's set on uh, speed of one, spindle speed of 16,000 RPM. And we want a chip load of three thousandths to five thousandths of an inch. So each time the tooth comes around, whether it's a two, three, four tooth uh, cutter or flute cutter, uh, you want it to remove that much material. So if you wanted to remove three thousandths of an inch every time that bit comes around at 16,000 RPM, you need to scoot the bit through the material at a fairly quick rate. Now, a lot of these beginner level machines are limited on how fast they can move. And that will really be the, the limiting factor on this. We can only slow the spindle down as slow as it will go, and we can only make the machine move either as fast as it will go or as fast as it can go based on ma material constraints of the machine, whether that is uh, due to the spindle knot or the, the structural rigidity of the machine uh, and, and flex, whether it's in the gantry or, you know, a lot of machines have that flex within the, the uh, spindle mount on, on the gantry, or it's based on belt slip on the machine. I know that I just talked to a guy recently that even though he has a machine with a two foot by three foot cutting area, he can only travel 65 inches per minute with a DeWalt or a large Porter cable 890 router mounted in it. So he has a two and a quarter horsepower router, but he can only travel at 65 inches per minute. Now he's still only going to be able to chop down to 65 or sorry, 16,000 RPM. So what that means is he's not going to be able to achieve a proper chip load because of the cutter diameter and the travel speed or the number of flutes. So we do the, honestly, we do the best that we can with calculating these. And if you want to find a chip load calculator like this, uh, we'll look at this over here on the screen and I'll throw this back up over here. Uh, we'll go side by side on this 
and we'll go to our CNC router feed speed calculator. There's a lot of these on the uh, on the interwebs that we can look at, and always, yep, we got cookies. They're going to use them whether we acknowledge them or not. So this, you know, this is one of the first links that comes up, and you can see that the number of flutes times your chip load times your RPM uh, gives you your feed speed in units of inches per minute or millimeters per minute, depends on how you look at it. Um, so at two flutes of a chip load of 0.1 millimeters in this, uh, times our RPM is 3,600 millimeters per minute. And that gives you, if you want to do unit conversions, I don't really like doing unit conversions on this. Uh, make zine, this, this article is actually really good and it talks about your feed speeds and it goes in here and it, so spindle speed, feed rate, step down, step over. And so when you look at chip load, uh, for small bits, start at five thousandths of an inch. You can go up to ten thousandths of an inch. The important thing with, to keep in mind with chip load on any of those cutters is that chip, as it's being removed, is removing not just material, but it's removing heat from that cutting edge. That heat that's being removed does two things. One, it keeps the material from overheating, which can cause a fire because wood is flammable. So is plastic. Pretty much anything we work with on our uh, routers is a flammable material. And the second thing that it does is it keeps the bit from overheating, which can dull the edge excessively fast. It can end up with burning and scorching of uh, wood materials. And you can see bits that turn black over time if they don't have a, an adequate feed speed or chip removal on them. So when you're looking at this, so if you plug in your variables, if you have a uh, chip load of 10 thousandths times your flutes times your uh, speed, you can find that if you go back around 200 inches per minute at 10,000 RPM, uh, you can just rearrange the equation and get what you want out of it. And so for small bits, start with five thousandths of an inch for a quarter or larger. You can, uh, you probably not break anything at 10 thousandths of an inch, but the larger the chip load, the more force that's being put on that bit. So if you have an eighth inch diameter bit, but the bits really long, such as the amount of 40, uh, 46292 and we'll take a look at that uh this is a fantastic fantastic cutting bit um uh let's see 46292 this bit is it's a phenomenal bit uh now it's eighth inch diameter but it's got a one and three thirty seconds cutting length on it so you can do deep cutouts deep profiles uh and you don't waste a whole lot of material on there uh, getting cut out and you can get into those smaller uh, radius places and get a real detailed cutout on that. Now you don't want to feed this one as quickly because you have cutter flex that will come into this or deflection. So now that we've kind of talked briefly about the, the chip load and feed calculator, um, you can use that material to set up your tools. Now these tools that you have in your tool database, other than sitting down with the paperwork that comes with your tools and, and doing all the math on this, there's another really efficient way to get this done. And right here from the, from the Google, what we can find is if we search our Amana tool database, without the spelling error in there, uh, Tools Today has it as well. Uh, we'll go back right here on amanatool.com they have the amana tool vectric library one very important thing to note on this is it specifies that the file should only be used in conjunction with the specific tool number and that uh, it's a starting point right it's to be used as a starting point for your cnc and the parameters should be adjusted based on your project and material 
And the point that they don't mention is your particular machine. As I mentioned, if your machine can't move at 100 inches per minute or it can't move uh, in a particular fashion that it makes it a safe cutting or efficient cutting parameter, adjust it. So on the website, you just click the Vectric.tool file database. And if you try to open it from there, it tells you nothing's going to happen. So you actually just go over here to your Vectric software, click on your tool database button click import a tool database down here it's a little open folder open that folder and you'll see wherever you have your computer selected to go to downloads click on the amana tool vector dot tool file and you hit open and it poops in all of your amana tools this is every single bit that amana makes now if you don't have all these bits that's fine it is absolutely fine that you don't have all these bits because that would be a ridiculous amount of money. If you look at end mills, it shows that if you wanted to look at wood, it gives you eighth inch through three quarter shank bits that they offer. Now, if you say, I don't have any three, eight, three sixteenths shank bits, click on three sixteenths, hit the trash can button and it will remove those bits. You can clean up the library. And if you looked at your quarter inch shank and you said, Whoa, I don't have all these bits you can go ahead and remove those single ones uh, if you wanted to. You can also annotate the ones that you have. You can move them to a group so that if you wanted to make a, uh, a new group and we wanted to call this group here, uh, we're going to move this all the way up. And I clicked the, the wrong thing, All right? And we'll call this here. Oh, do do do. We're gonna add a group, and we're gonna call this. Oh, we're gonna rename that here. We're gonna call this tools I have. So now we have a group called tools I have. Now if we have a Amana, we'll go to one I'm uh, familiar with, engraving. We're going to go to the 4577-1K and we're going to take this all the way up. And we're going to drop this in tools I have and I know I have that bit. Now we've moved those bits from the Amana ones and we're gonna we know that we have this in our tool library and you can make a personalized tool library for your tools now Amana is not the only one with this we can also pull up a Whiteside tool database and there's a dot tool file for Whiteside tools and it pulls up this grid looking page of all of these different tools that Whiteside makes and you can download the entire Whiteside tool database and that will be set up the exact same way. You go over here, hit open and we'll open the Whiteside tool database. And again, you have all of the Whiteside bits so that if you have ordered any of those, you have them there. And under side, inside the group tools I have or whatever you want to name it uh, you can create subgroups within them uh, whether that is a uh, you know a, a taper ball nose or an end mill or an engraving bit uh, you can make your own groups and copy and paste those from the Amana tool or Whiteside or whatever other manufacturer that you want and you can put those into your own tool database of lists that you have so that you don't have to delete everything you don't have and as you get a new tool or cutter uh, and you want to import those settings you can bring those in you also have the opportunity if you have multiple to, uh, machines you can set up so say you had like a, an X carve and a shop saber 23 you'd obviously want different settings for those tools based on how fast the machine can travel and you can select what 
machine you are using for that tool so that you don't have to change your tool parameters each time. You can, uh, this is a new feature for version 10, select your material and you can select a new material. So if you had, uh, you wanted to put in for plastics or composites or wood or metal, uh, you can have several different material profiles that will adjust based on how you've programmed your bits uh, that you, you say, all right, my tool, I'm using uh, plastic this time and it will adjust those cutter settings or even your tool library for you, uh, particular to what you're trying to do. And that really helps with uh, helping sort things out when you have a lot of tools, you use different materials frequently, or uh, you just don't want to get confused. Up here at the top, what you're going to see is you have, it tells you if you're online and here you can upload your current tool database to the portal. Now I'm logged in, I'm online and you can upload and it says, Hey, this is going to overwrite the data on the server up last uploaded earlier today. Do you want to do this? I'll say, sure, I'll do that. And it says I've uploaded it to the server. Now with all my tools put onto the server, if I go to my other computer where I have Vectric installed as well, I can then hit this download and it will update all of your tools from the portal. One of the great things about this is should you know you drop your laptop in a puddle of water outside or your house gets struck by lightning, you know, whatever might happen. Uh, not that it's happened to me ever. You can always download your tool files again so you don't have to sit there and figure out how to do it. Uh, so that that fixes those things. Uh, so we see our cutter diameter, side angle, flat diameter. That's great. Now, if we were to go in here and I'm just going to throw something together real quick um, as, a, as a demonstration for this. Uh, so we'll draw a circle. We'll draw another circle. And we're going to talk about overall uh, toolpath optimization on this because what can be a real pain with some of these is figuring out what the best way to figure out your tool pathing strategy. Uh, so we'll go ahead, shrink this so that it fits in the bottom of here, shift click, align two, and it throws it in the middle. This one is going to be here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set up some tool pathing real quick. Jamie says he loves his X carve. Now it's not really an X carve. It's really a CNC machine that uses the X controller, which is a fancy gerbil controller with the power supply with an inventable spoil board. That's about all that is. All right, so we're going to throw in here. We're going to do a profile outside equals Z to do that. Uh, throw it outside. Don't care about tabs. And we're going to use our standard naming convention. We're going to do outside cutout quarter inch end mill. And if we preview this, this tool path, you can see the reason we didn't add tabs is so we can get rid of it. Go ahead and click this button up here to arrange vertical and we'll hit our Z preview or we'll do our view here. So let's say we're going to cut this out and we want to hog this out and we're going to go down 0.25 deep. We're going to keep our numbers really simple on this and we want to use a larger area clearance tool. We're going to use a three quarter inch end mill on this one and a quarter inch down cut. Uh, we're going to raster this. I choose to raster on this one because my machine is much more steady on the X axis than it is along the Y. And we're going to call this clear pocket because we're going to hog some stuff out. Uh, and what we can see is when we preview our visible tool path, our three quarter inch end mill cuts all this, then our quarter inch end mill 
we're going to clean clean up the inside edge this pocket and this pocket we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut those down to 0 0.45 we're going to use a larger area clearance tool on these and the same and we're just going to call these first pockets and it's important here that we have the ramp plunge moves selected for this so that uh, when we're using a, a two flute end mill it's just a regular router bit that it doesn't plunge into the wood and burn it uh, burn up the bit stall the motor the stepper motors what have you uh, and we'll preview those visible tool paths so what we see is we actually did this in a very inefficient manner what we said is we want these to cut down 0.45 inches from the top surface of the material that's not a smart way to do it because your first out of four passes if we hit edit passes they're going to go 0.1125.225 so it, we're not going to start touching material until our third pass on this so what we can do in our tool pass setup is go 0 0.25 here and we're going to cut 0 0.2 deep that will give us the same depth from the surface that we're going to do but it's only going to take two passes and what we see is cuts through but then on that second tool right here where we're cutting these pockets out it's actually going to start at the surface of the material because we've already we already know how far it's going to go down now if you, you have any doubts about this we have our surface of the material and if you look right here and when I, I move my mouse to show you uh, it doesn't show up but when you look right there it shows our Z is at 0, 0.00 and then we move over and it's minus one quarter inch and now it's minus 0. 0.45 so that's 0. 0.45 down from the top surface of the wood it does the same thing but it keeps our tool from cutting air and it keeps it cutting material which then reduces the total machine time now let's go ahead and set our tool path for this and we want this tool path uh, we're just gonna make this another pocket except we're gonna make this one starting at 0 0.2 and we're gonna make this one cut 0 0.45 deep so that's a total of 65 thousandths the material 75 thousandths we'll call this deep pocket and we're going to use our NMIT large clearance tool as well. So if we preview our visible tool paths on this, we see that we're going to create a stepped pocket inside here. The last thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up our text and we're going to select both of our texts. Well, so we're not going to select both of our texts because they're at different heights. So this one, our start depth on this we know that was 0 0.25 we're not going to set a flat depth on this we are going to use our 45771 uh, 30 degree engraving bit and we're going to call this test uh, 30V and we don't have a 3D model and we're going to hit calculate on there uh, we can preview that visible toolpath and then this one if we look in here we're at minus 0.45 that shows up right there on the bottom of the screen again so we know that that one we can start at 0 0.45 this was at a quarter of an inch so we have bottom selected and we'll go to here and we're going to start that 0 0.45 using the same tool and we'll call this bottom 30 V and we'll calculate that now, the one of the more, uh, I, I, I would not call it problematic things, but challenges to overcome is minimizing the number of tool changes. So understanding that, well, you could change a tool and run these in particular order, top to bottom. That may not be the most efficient way to accomplish the task. So let's look at our toolpath uh, generation, right? So we have all these individual toolpaths. Let's look at actual saving these toolpaths and putting them in a proper order. So let's group, I'm, I'm going to start by grouping them together. We know that all of these clearance 
right? That have clear in their name, use the three quarter inch end mill. Um, we know that we have first uh, clear pocket, the first pocket, the deep pocket, and here a outside profile cutout. Now the order in which they are here top to bottom is going to be the order that they run when you go to the save toolpaths. So we can see that if we select the three that are in the uh, why are we saving to axes? All right, it's because uh, we're going to go just generic machine. Uh, we're going to say we're going to output to the XCarve post processor. And we're going to select this up here at the top. This is output all visible toolpaths to one file. So we're going to output them to one file. And this is the order in which they will run. So we're going to run clear pocket, first pockets, deep pocket with the three quarter. And we're going to save this. And I'm going to throw this in my CNC things folder. And it should save it. Uh, maybe not. Hmm. All right. All right. So it did save, but it did not save as the file program that I wanted or the file name. So the file name that we want to do on this is, and this again is a convention that I've come up with that works really well. And that naming convention goes off of two things. We're going to go one tack 750EM. The reason it does that, we're doing that, is because the, the folder that we're putting these files into, it puts them in numerical order of which ones you want to run first. You've already made the decision before you're at your machine on which files you're going to run in what order and what tool runs them. So we're going to save that. And we're going to clear our tool paths that we've selected. We know we selected the first three. So now we're going to throw our next four tool paths on here. Those next four tool paths all use the same tool, the quarter inch down cut end mill. And we're going to save those paths to one file. So we're going to name that one 2-250EM. And then lastly, we can add our tool paths of 3-30V. And that tells us that that's the third tool path we're going to run and it runs the 30 degree V bit. Now, when we run these in order using our tool path simulator, we're going to be able to see that if we reset preview and run our first three and we preview those three tool paths, It shows that we cleared out our large portion and then the majority of those. Now, if we clear, it's going to show the cleanup of those two pockets. And we'll preview those two paths. So now we've completed six different tool paths. Here comes number seven. That's seven tool paths that we've created with only one tool change. Then lastly, we come in with our V bit. And while they are different tool paths because they're at different levels within the model, they're saved as one file. And that one file outputs and it machines both of those. So then when we hit preview visible tool path, it throws the letters exactly where they're supposed to be. Now, let's say you, that this is a great model, but you want to see what tools did what jobs. Let's say on the end of it, that you are going to paint these letters black. You can go up here, click toolpath color and select black. Now you notice right here, because this one was highlighted blue, that's the one it selected. So we'll go back up here and we'll just hit material color on those. And then we want to make sure that these it's not check marks. It's highlighted blue. We'll go toolpath color and We'll select 
those. And so when we deselect these, you can see that those are now black inside. Now, if you wanted to see what is getting cut out of your individual tool paths, say like you wanted to make all your uh, three quarter inch end mills orange here, you could see what your three quarter inch end mill is cutting. And then if you wanted to see what your quarter inch end mill was cutting, it's actually just going to cut that corner of the material. And that gives you an idea of what tool is doing what area. You can also use that to your advantage to simulate colors of a finished product if you wanted to. Well, I think that's about all I've got uh, for tonight. So we've been, uh, been at this for almost two hours and managed to get almost 40 minutes of content out of it. So does anybody, that, you know, a few viewers that we've got, do you, any of you guys have any questions about uh, what we covered, what we what we looked at, tool paths, how to get your tool library set up, organized, um, and efficient machining outputs, optimizing your tool paths? I'll give you a couple minutes while I uh, look at this and... Um, Anything else? So I, I greatly appreciate you guys that uh, have tuned in for these. Uh, we've done a few of them over the last uh, week and I've, I've actually been blown away at the response that I've gotten. Uh, Jamie says, if you want to speed up the speed of your cutting. So once you have your optimized tool, parameter set here in your tool library um, we'll say like here we're using a 30 degree V angle and when you select your tool it gives you your your tool settings that you have here um, and this is this is great right um, but you don't want to modify things in here. So if you go to your edit tab, this is where you can change things. If you want to go faster, just hit like 100 and put that in there. Now, your machine is only going to go as fast as the machine sets itself. And that's inside the controller. Um, and those are based on your stepper motors or servos, how fast the machine limitations are set. You can go up to those speeds, but it's not going to go faster than those. Um, and, and that's a, a hardware based limit. So if you even put in, say you have an X carve and you want to run that at 500 inches per minute, it will, it will, uh, limit that number to the fastest that you can go. Now, how fast you can go and upping this, the speed of your machine Again, it goes into structural rigidity of the machine and then back into spindle speed, chip loading. Um, so if you are using a tool and you're just hogging things out, doing a, a roughing pass on a 3D model, you can do a 50% step over with a quarter inch end mill and get rid of a lot of material really quickly because it's a roughing pass. And the other thing that that ends up being into it is the acceleration and deceleration of the machine because if you've got this 12 pound carriage that has to accelerate up to speed and then it has to slow down the machine takes into account the acceleration deceleration rates uh, and that's not something that a lot of us see through our standard software uh, if you get into like using Mach 4 or some of the other uh, CNC control software you can see your acceleration deceleration rates and how those play into your machine and that is why the higher end more structurally rigid machines your commercial uh, level machines are able to achieve the cutting speeds they are is because they are so much struc more structurally rigid that they don't have the flex they can accelerate more quickly decelerate more quickly change direction and they don't flex at all. So on those, they can take off, uh, you know, 10 thousandths per tooth, but they're spinning 20,000 RPM because 
they can move at 500 inches a minute consistently and smoothly through that material. All of the how fast you can go for any of our machines that we commonly have, uh, whether it is anything from my small uh, Piranha FX all the way up through any of the higher end hobby grade machines or in adventurist machines, I guess you'd call them, uh, your Axiom AR8 Pros, things like that. You are truly going to be limited by speed of the machine more than spindle speed. So there's no need to run your spindle at 24,000 RPM because you cannot keep up with your chip load requirements uh, or recommended chip load settings for that spindle speed compared to your feed speed. Uh, so feed speeds being the limiting factor because your chip load is a how many how much material it removes per cutter moving past the material and if you can't move the machine fast enough there's no need to spin the spindle faster than the machine can accept um, and how fast can you go send the machine as fast as it will go and give you the results that you desire that's really all I've got to say about that one uh, the and the other thing that gives you a good idea is your ears if it if it sounds really bad then it's probably not good and it's time to just slow it down uh, and and play with it figure out what works well for you different materials respond differently but generally all hardwoods are uh, about the same so send it all right guys uh, I think I feel like I've done enough talking for tonight if you guys have any other questions feel free to uh, send me a message or post it up in one of the the groups uh, again you can find me on Facebook YouTube uh, and a lot of you guys have my phone number as well so go ahead ask the questions I'll uh, do my best to give you an answer if I can't if I don't know the answer I'll I'll look it up with you we'll find it we'll learn together and uh, till we talk again Keep your fingers out of that table saw.